Okay. I would like to thank everyone for coming to this Controversial Issues series, the first one ever done by Zoom. And I thank Sharon Leibovitz for making this happen. And I thank all of you for tuning in. I'm very excited about the format because before we could only have people that lived within our proximity and people who didn't like to drive at night had difficulty showing up. Now everybody's welcome. We have challenges from this virus, but we also have opportunities. And I believe that this technology we will now use probably forever so that we can always include people from all over the world potentially to join in this discussion. This is one of the most important and controversial topics ever. Perhaps in the human race, this topic is of the most importance. I took the liberty of inviting two Christian clergy this evening. Uh, one of them declined, and I was somewhat saddened that he wasn't able to make it, but also quite relieved. The reason I was relieved is because I cannot discuss this topic without being completely candid and open, and I will not sugarcoat what I believe to be true and what I believe to be gross mistakes of other religions. I freely criticize my own and I freely criticize others. And my discussion about the Messiah would be highly offensive to practicing Christians. The, the Christian that I know of who would not be offended in the least is Pastor Fritz Oftenkamp, who I also invited but wasn't able to attend. He uh, shares my views towards Jesus and the Messiah. Most Christians do not. So let me begin, and I know this is being recorded, and I hope that if you find what I have to say interesting or noteworthy or significant, that you might go to our website, Congregation Le Dorvador, find this on the website and send it out to others because I believe the message is most important. Let me explain why. The concept of whether or not Jesus was the Messiah is the pivotal point upon which all of Christianity hinges. If Jesus was not the Messiah, the entire religion is based on a lie. If Jesus was not also God or the Son of God, the entire religion is based on a lie and is erroneous. Now, it is true that there are many Christians today, modern Christians, who no longer accept the divine identity of Jesus. They no longer accept the virgin birth, some of them don't even accept the resurrection. These types of Christians are far from the mainstream. Most of them have become Unitarian or non-practicing. But there are some Christians who will say, well, Jesus didn't really meet the criteria of Messiah, but we think he's a great guy, and so we uh, celebrate his life. Those Christians are not in the majority, but they certainly, certainly do not represent organized Christianity as we know it. So for thousands of years, about 2,000 years, the entire Christian religion was based on the sine qua non of Christianity. Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. I believe both of those assertions are not only false, I believe they are patently absurd, and I believe they can be proven to be false. This is a highly controversial statement to make. Most people say it's a matter of faith. You either have faith that he was the Messiah or you don't. You have faith that he was God or you don't, and you can't argue with faith. That is not true. People who have faith want you to believe it, but it is not true. If I have faith that Martians have invaded Earth and right now they are running the country, I could say, well, you can't challenge that, but somebody could say, okay, where's the evidence? Where's the proof? And if I have none, my assertion looks ridiculous, and you could easily dismiss it. The great scientist Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Therefore, if someone is going to say Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God and fulfilled all the prophecies, and our religion is true, that's an extraordinary claim. They need to have some proof. I suggest there's none, and all the proof is to the contrary. So, these are propositions that are testifiable, verifiable, and provable one way or the other. 
I will spend a fair amount of time tonight disproving those concepts, but I want to set the stage for this discussion and also explain the significance of it. Many people will say, well, who cares? You know, as long as people are happy, who cares? If, if they're happy believing he was the Messiah or the Son of God, or they're going to live happily ever after in, in heaven with Jesus, who cares? Well, my friends, we all should care because people who believe these concepts are shaping the policies that govern this nation. The fundamentalist Christian right is the group that put Donald Trump into office and supports many of the policies of the Republican Party. You may find these policies to be good, or you may find them to be bad. But what cannot be questioned is that the fundamentalist Christian community has put people into office, like our president, and supports the Republican Party so that certain issues are now the law of the land. For instance, abortion rights, gun control, environmental policies, church state separation, and uh, perhaps among the most important, whether this planet is worth saving or whether this is just a way station for us to figure out where we're gonna go up or down in the next life. If that is the case, then environmentalism is really a waste of time. Why bother protecting this environment when this earth is meaningless? It's just a testing ground for the real action, which is in heaven and hell. In fact, many Christians believe that the destruction of this planet is a good thing. Why? Because for Jesus to return, he has to come at the end times, a time called Armageddon. Armageddon is from Hal Megiddo in Hebrew, Mount Megiddo. It's a time of cataclysmic conflict and, and change. It's a time when everyone's fighting and there's destruction all over. It's this, a time of planetary collapse. So the destruction of the environment, which should be the greatest cause of concern for a large segment of the population is a source of rejoicing. They do nothing to stop it and everything to encourage it. Just like nuclear annihilation, which to a rational person is very scary, to people who believe that Jesus was the Messiah and he's coming back again, this is a good thing because before he can come back, certain prerequisites have to happen. And one of them is the destruction of all life and, and horrific warfare, unlike any ever seen before. Therefore, the question is of utmost importance. So let me explain the concept of Messiah. Let me take a little bit of time to explain the concept, what it actually means, and why Jesus was probably the last person on earth who could have fulfilled the criteria and the role of Messiah. By the way, I've argued and debated this for years, one of which was one with a leading Jewish missionary, someone who was born Jewish and accepted Jesus, who writes voluminous books on it, lectures and debates all over the country. I debated him, and the debate is on a cassette that I would love to share. It was about 20 years ago. And uh, I'm going to try to make that available to Lador Vador, because I think you'll find it fascinating, one, to see me without gray hair, but also to see me do battle with someone who is one of the leading proponents in the world on the proposition that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Yeah, just for sheer entertainment value, it's good. So let's begin. What is the Messiah? First of all, if someone does not speak Hebrew, they're at a severe disadvantage because Messiah is a Hebrew term. If you don't know Hebrew or understand Hebrew, you're really not in a position to claim to be an authority on the Messiah. So what does Messiah actually mean in the Hebrew? The word in Hebrew is pronounced Mashiach. Mashiach is someone upon whom oil is sprinkled in a process called anointment. He is someone anointed with oil. The word in English, a shah, or a sheikh, or a sheikh, in the Muslim world, comes from the very same word, shah, sheikh, sheikh, mashiach. It's also related to the word check, mate. Met in Hebrew means dead. Check, mate means the shah, or the sheikh, is dead. And it's all related to this term, Mashiach. 
Mashiach is someone anointed in oil. Who was anointed in oil in the old days? This was a ceremony of dignity and respect for people who were esteemed in the community. For instance, judges, leaders, and kings were anointed with oil. The most famous of which normally would be thought of as a king. A king is anointed, and that anointed is related to the word ointment, meaning that oil was put upon him. So Mashiach means someone who is anointed. So who was the Mashiach or the Messiah, if we say in English? Mashiachs were many, many, many kings of Israel. All the kings of Israel were Mashiach. Not only that, some people who were not Jewish were called the Mashiach. For instance, Cyrus the Great of Persia allowed the Jewish people to return to Israel. He took over after the Babylonian captivity. He made an alliance with the Jewish people and allowed them to return, and he was a king. Therefore, he was called the Messiah, or Hamashiach, that was predicted in Jewish scripture, someone who would cause the return of the Jews to the promised land. So the word Mashiach was not meant to be used to describe one person. It was used to describe a whole bunch of people who were anointed with oil. How you may ask, if this term was used ubiquitously across the board by so many people, how did it come to be applied to only one person, the Messiah, and also to Jesus? How did that process happen? To understand that, you have to understand Jewish history. Jewish history has evolved, concepts evolved. The, the term, the Messiah concept has evolved. As I mentioned, in biblical days, the Messiah was almost anybody who was anointed. Later on, when the Jews were living under foreign occupation, especially when they were living under Greek rule and then Roman rule, they started to long for a Jewish king. Under Greek rule, they were living in foreign occupation until the Maccabees established a Jewish hegemony over the promised land. And they had Jewish kings, the Hasmonean kings, and they were all called Hamashiach. They were the Messiah, the long awaited Messiah had returned. Unfortunately, they were corrupt. And also they faced a foe more formidable than any of the past, the Romans. When the Romans came in, there was no longer any Jewish autonomy in the promised land. They lived under Roman occupation. Roman occupation was particularly barbaric around the time that Jesus is said to have lived. What happened was the Jews were longing for independence, and that independence would come from a king who was part of the Davidic line. The Jewish people believed in the hereditary monarchy, and therefore David was the last great king of Israel. And so they looked forward to another person in the line of David who would become a king of Israel. As the concept evolved, they began to attach eschatological significance and meaning to the term Messiah. When, the, when times got desperate and the Jewish people waited year after year after year and century, they started to believe that maybe this wasn't gonna just happen in the normal course of events. They thought it's not working, something has to happen from, from God himself. God himself must intervene in a majestic way to make this happen to defeat the Romans. And therefore this term Messiah started to be laden over with many types of eschatological or end of the world predictions. And so they began to believe that when the Messiah comes, this would be the most glorious redemption ever because the Roman Empire was the most ferocious empire ever known, and therefore it would have to be some type of divine deliverance. And so they began to embellish this concept of Messiah. Now, you, we also have to remember that there were many, many types of Jews living in those days. In order to understand the Messiah, you have to understand Jewish history and what was going on in the Jewish homeland at the time of the Roman Empire. Most Christians have no idea about that, nor do they want to know. The last thing they want to do is apply scholarship to an issue that is believed on faith 
in, which means in the absence of evidence. The more evidence that they amass, the less likely and the more holes are punched into their concepts, so they don't care to know. In the Jewish homeland at that time, there were major groups of Jews. There was the Sadducees, there were the Pharisees, there were the Essenes, and other smaller groups of people. The, uh, the Pharisees were actually the modern reform rabbis of the time. They were people who, who felt that Judaism should evolve and change, and they were people who had taken Judaism to a, a progressive type of uh, interpretation, no longer fixated on the, on the rituals and the, and the rules. The Sadducees were part of the temple establishment. They had actually allied with Rome because they were in power and they guarded over the temple and they wanted to ingratiate themselves with Rome so that they could carry some amount of power under this occupation. And so they were collaborators. The, the common people did not care for the Sadducees. They, they seemed as if they had caved into Rome. Then you also had groups like the Essenes. The Essenes were, uh, they believed that the end of times were coming and they believed that so strongly that they went into caves like the caves of Qumran and they decided to live out their lives in isolation waiting for the end of days. These groups especially started to talk about the Messiah in, in terms that were uh, very majestic and also believed that there were going to be all types of supernatural events associated with the coming of the Messiah. So, there were also groups of Jews at that time who were called, who were Hellenized Jews. Mind you that the Jews lived either in the Jewish homeland because they, they had, the temple was still existent and so they had not been dispersed or in the diaspora, in the Greek speaking world. So you had Jews who spoke Aramaic, Hebrew had evolved into that in, in the Jewish homeland. And outside of that, in the Greek world, like Alexandria and major cities, cosmopolitan, wealthy Jews, were living in, under the Greek empire, and they began to accept parts of the Greek theology, religion, philosophy into Judaism, much as American Jews now use English to read the prayers and uh, an American style democracy to understand Judaism. These Jews in the Greek speaking world began to interpret Judaism in a way that was consistent with Greek philosophy and thought. Part of that is reflected in the Passover Seder, where we have the Afikomen, which is from Greek words after the meal, and the four questions, which is the Socratic method of learning that was instituted by the Greeks, which Jews learned from. These Greek-speaking Jews then adopted many aspects of Greek religion, which were a, a belief that God was a male and would impregnate a virgin female and produce hybrid children. This story is ancient, it's part of Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Persian mythology. The Jews never had such a thing. They didn't believe in God producing children or, or, or virgins having children, but it was very big in the Greek world. And so when Judaism got interpreted through a Greek lens, polytheism entered the picture. And therefore you have the concept of the virgin birth. I'm getting a little far afield as far as the Messiah goes, but I need to set this up. And there's a lot that I won't say as far as how we can disprove the concept. There's just too much to cover in an evening and I'll spend more time on it. But let's get to the gist of it then, the Messiah. As the Jews yearned for the Messiah, they began to write and to prophesy about it. And they had teachings, prophecies, that described the coming of the Messiah. What were these prophecies? As I mentioned, he would come from the line of David. That was the monarchical line. The Messiah would end all suffering. Remember, the, this concept of Messiah as interpreted through the Greek speaking Jews as understood at the time of the Roman empire became associated with fantastic claims. So the Messiah would end suffering the Messiah would actually end death. The Messiah would rebuild the temple. The Messiah would lead armies to fight off any occupying force and establish an era of Jewish independence. The Messiah would bring a time of universal peace. The Messiah would bring about a time when people all over the world would come to Jerusalem 
and would learn the truth and would learn peace and shalom and justice, and everyone would live happily ever after. There were many other criteria of the Messiah, but those were the main aspects of it. Now, let us look to the life of Jesus and see whether these prophecies, these criteria, these indicators were met in order to find out if Jesus was indeed the predicted, long-awaited Messiah. According to the scriptures, the Messiah would shake off all foreign occupiers. He would lead the Jewish people into battle and defeat any empire that tried to overcome the Jewish people. This was why the Jewish people under the Maccabees were willing to risk their lives against a far greater empire, the Greeks, because they believed that God would fight for them and numbers didn't matter. It didn't matter how powerful the Greeks were, or how unpowerful the Jews were, it did not matter because God could destroy any army. So he would defeat any army. So I see um, my battery is running low on my computer. I'm not sure why. Hold on one second. I'm going to make sure it's plugged in. Basically, was based on him being plugged in to the eternal power of the universe. He had a direct pipeline. He was plugged into God himself and would be able to channel the power of God and unleash that power against all of our enemies. So let's see what happened now. So Jesus if he lived, and that's a big if, that's another issue. Did Jesus live or not? Many scholars are not sure whether he did or not. I happen to be of the ilk that believes that there's not enough evidence to know one way or the other, whether he in fact lived or not. But let's take Christian scripture at face value, which obviously we can't do, it's riddled with inconsistencies, but let's just accept for the moment what it's saying. It's saying that Jesus lived around 30 to 40 CE, and he lived under Roman occupation. Now the Messiah was gonna lead armies and destroy the Roman empire. That's why in Christian scripture, one of his followers took up a sword and took the sword in order to strike at the Romans, even though he was hopelessly outnumbered. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't do that. My armies are different. So did Jesus defeat the Romans? The exact opposite happened. The Romans, crucified him and after his life instead of being liberated from rome the temple was obliterated and the romans destroyed much of the landscape and killed many many thousands of jews and eventually exiled them so the exact opposite happened at the time of the messiah the jews were supposed to be independent they lost totally their independence and their temple and were exiled the Messiah was also su supposed to bring all the Jews back into the Jewish homeland. Well, the opposite happened. Shortly after the time of Jesus, the Romans scattered the Jews all across the land. The, the Messiah was supposed to rebuild the temple. In fact, that was impossible because the temple was already built in the time of Jesus. But shortly after Jesus, the, the temple was destroyed. So the exact opposite happened. The Messiah was supposed to end all suffering and death. At the time of Jesus, there was massive suffering, Jews being crucified relentlessly, persecution that was, in, that was bitter, and then massive destruction. The Messiah was supposed to bring a time of universal peace. There was chaos. Every one of the major criteria of the Messiah was not only not met, the exact opposite happened. You could argue very well that he could have been the last person ever. Let's take another prophecy, very interesting one. The Messiah was supposed to be of the line of David. Now people say, well, at least he got that one right, didn't he? Well, not exactly. If you read Christian scripture, which I encourage you to do, you will see that there are lineages of Jesus. The, in order to show that Jesus was of the line of David, they say, okay, this person begat, that person begat, that person begat, that person. It's really quite extraordinary. They actually 
attempt to go from the beginning, from Abraham, from from Adam and Eve, all the way through Abraham, all the way through the time of Jesus, to show that Jesus was in the lineage of the line of David. And it's quite impressive until you compare the, the lineages, the genealogy. When you compare the, the genealogy in Matthew and Luke, it's given twice. When you compare those, you run into a problem. They wanted to make it nice so that there were 14 generations. They divided up into 14 generations from one to the other. And then there were going to be 14 generations from the time of David to Jesus. There's only one problem, though. In Matthew and Luke, it's different. In one of them, there's only 13 generations. One of the patriarchs is gone. You might ask, how did that happen? Well, there was a no good scoundrel of a king whose name was Jaconia. And Jaconia was considered disloyal to God. And therefore, one of the prophets said, because of your disloyalty, no Jewish monarch will ever descend from your loins. But the problem was, in one of the lineages, he was mentioned, Jaconia. And the prophet said that he couldn't possibly be the ancestor of the Messiah. Well, that was easy. They just got rid of him. So he disappeared off of one of the lineages. Problem is now you only have 13. So the, the lineages are different. But that's only the half of it. It gets much, much, much worse. There are also major, there are major similarities. And then there's also some differences in the genealogies. And then you get down to the bottom. And then you get to Joseph. Joseph is then described as the father of Jesus. So they're proving that he was the son of David because the, the lineage goes to the father Joseph and then all the way back through David. It seems very fine. Both of them, both lineages, even though they're divergent, agree on going back to David. The only problem is that later on in Christian history, they came up with this concept of virgin birth. We know it was a later fabrication because it wasn't used in the original and it wasn't even mentioned in two of the gospels. You would think it's kind of hard to omit, oh, by the way, he was born of a virgin to God himself. How could that be omitted? Simple. These, this story came into Jewish or Christian theology later on after the first two books were already written. Well, these first two books describe the lineage of Jesus through David, through Joseph, his father. But when the virgin birth was promulgated, Joseph no longer became his father. Now the whole ideology, the whole lineage is a waste. Why bother saying that Joseph descended from David and Jesus from Joseph if Joseph was no longer his father? The father was God and Mary. Joseph had nothing to do with it. So they ran into a big problem. Not to worry. Catholic Church has a reason for everything. You see, what the, the, the reason why there's a divergence and the reason why they trace it through Joseph is because one of the lineages is actually the genealogy of Mary, his mother, who was also, by coincidence, a descendant of David? It just doesn't say that in there. So it's still tracing it through David. Well, you would say, well, wait, how could it be through Mary? Mary wasn't even mentioned. They both go through Joseph and then Jesus. How could it possibly be that this is the genealogy of Mary when she's not even mentioned? That's not a problem either. That's easy. Mary was a woman. And because Mary's a woman, you don't bother mentioning her. She's not significant because the genealogy only mentions men. Well, but what about Mary being the Virgin Mary? You have icons and statues and everything, the mother of God. Well, she's still a woman, so she doesn't get mentioned. So actually, the father of Mary was also named Joseph. So this lineage here that goes through Joseph, that's really the father of Mary, then Mary, and then Jesus. So that's the lineage. You have to really go through a lot of mental gymnastics in order to try to explain how it is that these genealogies fit and that he was the Messiah. He clearly was not the Messiah through the son of David according to these genealogies because the, the arguments that are raised are completely nonsensical. Here's the problem though. 
Christians had based their entire lives on Jesus being the Messiah and, and being the son, and the son of God. When he, was, when he was on the cross, their hopes were dashed and they were extremely depressed. They couldn't believe that they had been misled or mistaken. And so someone came to the rescue. Polemicists who were brilliant at saying, wait, 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 I have, an, I have a reason for this. I can explain all of it. It's very much like you have a politician and he says something and it didn't come out right. And then his handlers come over and say, oh, no, no, no. Let me tell you what he really meant. Let me show you how this is really true. Sadly, we've seen quite a bit of that recently. So what happened? How did they explain that? Well, here, here it is. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is going to fulfill all of these things the next time around. This time, he didn't do all these things, but he's going to come back again, and then you watch. Next time around, he'll get it right, and he'll do all of those things. He'll bring about the messianic times. If you are sufficiently brainwashed, and if you are sufficiently in a cult and indoctrinated into that cult so much that you have to believe, then you can believe anything. Because remember, when you believe on faith, faith is the absence of evidence. So the lack of evidence doesn't mean a darn thing. In fact, according to Christianity, the more absurd and outrageous and outlandish these notions are, the more you should believe and the more you're going to be rewarded. After all, if you believe something based on evidence, what value is that? What merit is that? That does you no good in the eyes of God. Everyone is going to believe something if they can see it with their own eyes. It takes someone of true faith, someone who's very loyal, who will believe things that defy reason and defy logic, and in the face of all evidence of the contrary will believe it. So they came up with something that made absolutely no sense, but it was actually a selling point. And so rationally, Jesus clearly did not meet any of the criteria. To suggest he's going to come again doesn't quite hold water. Why? Well, for one thing, it's, it, it, it wasn't believed until after he failed, and then it was an afterthought that well, he's going to come back again. The other problem is that Christians base their belief in the Messiah on Jewish scripture. They say he fulfilled the requirements of Jewish scripture. All of Jewish scripture only talks about the Messiah coming once. Jewish scripture never, ever, ever says the Messiah will come, be killed, crucified, fail, come back again, and get it right the second time. It's not there. So if you're going to say, well, he fulfilled Jewish scripture, then you have to go with Jewish scripture. You can't say he fulfilled Jewish scripture, but we're going to amend it. Now he's going to come back again. Let me share with you one other major, major problems in, in Christian belief in the Messiah which is also based on mistranslations and misunderstandings. To put it generously, we could say that people who began the religion of Christianity didn't quite understand Hebrew too well and Jewish scripture. Or if you were of a more cynical bent, you would say that they intentionally mistranslated things to deceive people. In fact, there is a verse in Christian scripture in which the architect of Christianity, who is Paul, says, I am all things to all people. To a Jew, I'm a Jew. To a Gentile, I'm a Gentile. To an idol worshiper, I'm an idol worshiper. I am all things in order to win people over to Jesus. And so you could say that the, the art of deception was really something that was part and parcel of, of Christianity in general as it got started. So the, the, the concept of, of the Messiah was something that was used in order to try to get people to believe. When the concept didn't work out, then they had to come up with plan B. Now, in Christian scripture, there are many, many, many different predictions that are made. Let me just give you one other major one. According to Christians, Christian apologetics, or people who promote Christianity, Jesus fulfilled the requirements of Messiah because he was born the son of a virgin. And that was so spectacular that that proves his credentials as the Messiah. Well, that's nice, except there's only one problem. 
Jewish scripture never mentions that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. There's no passage like that anywhere. The whole concept of a virgin, which is why many uh, fundamentalist Christians have sexual hangups about virginity and all this stuff and all this nonsense, is that the, the problem is that the concept of virginity came from the Greeks. It was part of Greek and Roman mythology that the God saw a virgin and wanted to have his way with her and produced a hybrid child. This is not in Jewish scripture at all. So they had to concoct something in Jewish scripture that says, oh, no, no, no. There is a prophecy in which the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Mind you, all of the prophecies, they don't even claim have such a passage, but they come up with one, one passage from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is talking to King Josiah, and what he's saying to King Josiah is, you are corrupt, and if you don't get your act together, if you don't follow God's ways, bad things are going to happen, and he will punish you. When would this happen? Well, prophets didn't just say, in a year or 13 years or five years, they speak in poetic prose. So they said, behold, a woman is with child. By the time he knows right from wrong, your kingdom will be destroyed unless you follow God's ways. What do uh, Christian apologists do or, or Christians who are trying to promote their brand of uh, their brand of Judaism, which they eventually call Christianity, they seize upon this passage and they say, "Aha! Isaiah predicted that a virgin would give birth in this passage." Actually, he did no such thing. He was just saying, "If if there was a woman with child, and by the time he knew right from wrong, which was kind of similar to us of bar mitzvah age." By the time he's 12 or 13, or in about 12 or 13 years, that's when this prophecy is going to happen. If you don't straighten out, I'm going to give you a long time. If you don't straighten out within that time period, you will suffer doom. So the Christians who, who try to justify that Jesus was the Messiah remove all other parts of the prophecy, with Josiah and talking about what he, was, what he was saying and what the significance was, it's all gone. All of it's gone. All that's left is, behold, a virgin will conceive a child. That's it. The rest of it out the window. There's one problem though, a big problem. If you don't speak Hebrew, it's not a problem at all. Or if your intentions are to deceive, it's not an issue. The problem is Isaiah never said a virgin would conceive. Isaiah used the Hebrew word alma. Alma means a young woman. There is another word in Hebrew that means virgin. It's betula. But Isaiah did not use that term. If he wanted to say virgin, he would have. But the Jewish scripture that was read by the Greeks was translated into Greek in the Septuagint. And then they used the word, which also didn't mean that, but then they mistranslated that word and said, aha, Isaiah predicted a virgin birth and Jesus is the one. As I say, it's based on a lie. And you might say that if a religion is based on a lie, then probably the rest of it doesn't make much sense either, which it doesn't. The whole concept of Jesus and Messiah, it's all nonsensical. But this is one of many ways that we know that the prophecies and the claims made were false. I could go on for at least five more hours sharing with you how we know for a fact that Jesus could not have been the Messiah how he could not have been the son of God. By the way, Jesus denied about 12 times that he was the son of God. Repeatedly, he said, I am not the son of God. I am not the son of God. I am not the son of God. I am not God. I'm not part of the Godhead. But his followers claimed that he was. Why? Because Greek mythology always had gods being worshiped. And so he had to be a God. Why, again, is this important? The reason why it's important is because many people base their lives on a misunderstanding, they're being misled, and Judaism is being used, abused, and perverted in order to promulgate claims that are false. Uh, you can see why I'm happy that my Christian colleague decide not, decided not to join us, because most Christians don't want to hear a rabbi saying this. You might ask yourself, if all these things are true, rabbi, if we know these things and we can prove beyond any doubt 
that Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah. And as I say, I've just scratched the surface. Why don't other rabbis say so? Why don't other rabbis just state the obvious and say so? My friends, that is a very good question. I think that the Jewish leadership and rabbis are totally derelict and negligent, and even, might I say, cowardly in not saying so. We believe in emet but tzedek. And if many people are going in the wrong direction, we have some obligation to try to share truth with them. And so I think that it's time for the Jewish community to speak up and to refute things that we know to be false. And so at this point, I am very interested in hearing from other people. And Sharon, you might want to unmute people and we can carry on the discussion. I will ask you, Sharon, to continue to record this part of the discussion because I will be raising other issues as well and sharing more about the concept of, of Messiah. I would like to invite other people to join in and you be aware that should you decide to do so, you may be taped. One final thing before we end this session. Am I saying that Jews should go around saying that Christianity is nonsense and it's all based on lies and that we, there's nothing in Christianity that is of any worth or merit? I am not saying that at all. What I am saying is that we should use reason in order to challenge misconceptions in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, starting with our own. We should challenge the absurd notion that God wrote our Bible or the Christian Bible or the Quran, and we should apply reason and science like a sieve to weed out false ideas and to promote ones that are valid. If we care anything at all about emet, about tzedek, truth and righteousness, then we have an obligation to spread the truth and not let people take our religion, Judaism, and misrepresent it in order to spread false claims to promote another one. One other thing, Jews do not believe in human sacrifice. We repudiate it. Christianity is based on it. They not only accept human sacrifice, they've built an entire religion around it. That concept is un-Jewish and it is not anything to do with the concept of Messiah, that the Messiah would become a human sacrifice. He was a human hero and a savior, not a, not a human sacrifice. Um, I, I would like to open it up now to um, folks, if you have a, a, a question, if you agree, if you disagree, I'd love to hear from you. So Sharon, I'll turn it over to you and perhaps you could turn it over to others. Okay, so I'm gonna put it on the gallery view so everybody can see each other. And if you wanna speak, okay, Roberta, let me uh, unmute you, go ahead, Roberta. For thousands of years, Jews have been persecuted because we killed their God, because we supposedly killed Jesus, which historically is not true. And it's a shame because uh, it's not true and many Jews died because of it. Okay, let me respond to what Roberta is saying, because what she's saying is one of the most important observations that we could make tonight. It's, it's, it's more than just a shame. Jews have been barbarically massacred and wiped out over the millennia based on this lie. It's not just of academic interest. And it's not just a matter of, well, as long as it makes them feel good or they like to believe it, that's fine. It is not fine. It's kind of like a virus. Viruses exist in our environment and they become latent and then they become manifest. Christianity and anti-Semitism, very often the anti-Semitism is latent. It lies below the surface. But when certain things happen in a society or a demagogue comes along or there's certain societal issues or problems, anti-Semitism emerges and these passages and these in this theology raises its ugly head and ends up in murdering Jews. And this is not something that only happened in the past. During the Holocaust, Jews were murdered and when people tried to seek help, they would say, this is payback. This is what you get for murdering Jesus. Correcting the record is something that any self-respecting group should do. 
And I believe in the name of all of those people who perished in the Holocaust and who perished in the Crusades and in the Inquisitions and in the pogroms and for thousands of years, we Jews who are free have the right to defend their honor and to say that they did not do the things that you accuse them of doing. They did not do these un unspeakable things. And what happened to them was a tragedy for which the Christian world should apologize and make amends and which we should take measures to make sure it never happens again. In fact, the exact opposite is happening within the Jewish community. The Jewish community never dares to challenge any of these concepts. They never dare challenge any of it. Why? In the name of political and religious correctness. Oh, we can't challenge anything in Christian scripture. That would be very impolite. That would be politically incorrect. We, we have to get along with them. And what you're suggesting, Rabbi, is a sure way to cause interfaith conflict and, and, and dissension. I believe it's too high a price to pay for our honor to be damaged and for Jews to be subjected to continual decimation and death because we want to try to curry favor with people. The two synagogue shootings in 2019 were both perpetrated by people who were perpetrating these myths about the Jews killing the Messiah and the Son of God. One of them was actually shouting that the Jews were of the devil, which is a quote from the book of John in Christian scripture, while he was shooting the Jews, which he got from his Christian upbringing. And the other one wrote a manifesto before the shooting, quoting Christian scripture at length, saying how the Jews were vile and sons of devil, and that's why they deserve to die. This is not of academic interest alone. And millions of people now are shown in, in uh, Christian churches and Sunday schools, The Passion of the Christ, in which Mel Gibson goes into gory detail about how the Jews killed the Messiah, which is now training a new generation of haters to go after Jewish people. And what's really sad is that these children are victims of mental child abuse, being trained and taught to hate Jews based on a lie. And, and as um, I believe it was Christopher Hitchens said, who was born this month, he said, how how sad and how tragic that people are still killing each other over ancient literature. I think the time has come for us to tell the truth. And that's why I speak out on this issue in this forum and in any forum. I seek to go to Christian churches, but they don't invite me. I seek to speak with other synagogues, but the rabbis there are also definitely not hearing this. They're not interested in hearing the message. Part of the reason is because they live in a glass house, some of them and they don't want to throw stones. If you start attacking the accuracy and the divine authorship of Christian scripture, it's not too long before someone comes back and challenges the divine author authorship of yours. I have no problem with that because I don't believe that, so I, I welcome that exchange. Many rabbis do not, but thank you for bringing up that point. Is there, did you want to add something to it or um, share something additional about that? Yes. Uh, not on that exact point, but I wanted to bring up the idea of the false messiahs in Jewish history. And they were oh, many, and uh, one particular one always caught my uh, interest was Shabbatai Tzvi, who had 10,000 followers all over Europe. I'm not sure what century, maybe the 16th century, whatever. Correct. And um, these 10,000 people would follow him any, everywhere. And they, they followed him, I guess, to a, a Muslim land. The Muslims got hold of him <laughs> and uh, told him that if he didn't convert, they'd chop his head off. So he decided, okay, they made him convert to Islam. And now the, the next thing is the Messiah, the uh, so-called Messiah is, is a Muslim and made him marry a Muslim woman in addition to his Jewish wife. And so he did. That was the end of him. <laughs> Roberta, yes, that, that is a classic lesson in how we should never underestimate the ability of people who are brainwashed to believe the most absurd notions. You're exactly right. And communities uprooted themselves and people gave up their life savings and followed him. And it was into, he was going to march into Israel, but before he got there, he was taken by the Sultan of Turkey and, and faced with that choice. When he converted, the people who were brainwashed, just like Jesus, when he was crucified, most Jewish people said, well, I guess we were wrong. He wasn't the Messiah. But some of them said, we can't be wrong. And they made up a thing about the second coming. What did they do with Sabbatai? See, they said, wow, he's even more miraculous than we thought. 
we thought that he was just the leader of the Jewish people. He's actually now a Muslim, which fulfills a prophecy that all religions are now going to follow Sabbatai. See, now he's in a position to have all the Muslims follow him too. What an amazing person he is. This just confirms our faith in him. And so they believed there were actually people up until modern times who actually believed in Sabbatai Tzvi still as the Messiah. That episode was very tragic, but not nearly as tragic as other false messiahs in Jewish history. Today we have Rabbi Schneerson, who's really just a footnote. They say he's the Messiah, which is an, it's fairly innocuous, other than the people who are just brainwashed and unable to think straight. But Schneerson told them, never set foot in a reformed synagogue or a progressive synagogue, because you'll be contaminated with a contagion, and you might actually begin to think like them. So they, the followers of him are very intolerant of other branches of Judaism, which is bad. But what was really bad was a false messiah named Bar Kochba. Bar Kochba led a revolution against Rome in 135 CE. He was highly charismatic and successful for a couple of years. Unfortunately, the Romans built up their forces and went after him and destroyed him. The Orthodox said that he was the messiah and so they couldn't be wrong. So they risked everything and because they were wrong, that caused Jewish people to suffer 2,000 years of misery and exile. What a tragic mistake based on a false messiah. You might think that the Orthodox would believe, you know what? We got that one wrong. We maybe should be more careful next time. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. You see, that was part of God's plan. If you're brainwashed, everything is part of God's plan because of a concept known in Orthodoxy and Kabbalah, which is Gamze le tova. This too is for the good. See, God controls everything, and therefore nothing can happen that's outside of God's control. How is that for the good? That the Jewish people lost their temple and were exiled, and a million of them probably were killed, and massive suffering. How is that good? It's part of God's plan. God wanted the Jewish people to be dispersed among all the peoples of the world so they could spread monotheism to all the other people. And look what happened. The Roman Empire adopted the teachings of a Jew and adopted Christianity, which is a form of Judaism. So look at that. The Jewish people accomplished a great thing because of God. And now all the people accept Judaism through the form of Jesus. The problem is that Judaism isn't really the same as Christianity. We believe you're born good, they believe you're born evil. We, we believe in one God, they believe in three. We believe this world can be perfected, they believe that you should focus everything on the next. I mean, there's a lot of huge major differences, but that doesn't matter to the indoctrinated. My, my friends, we're in a serious situation here because a large number of Jewish people believe these things that are outside of reason. And a lot of these people who believe these things are trained to believe based not on evidence, but on faith and in the absence of evidence. Therefore, if you want to tell them that climate change is a hoax, they will believe it. If you want to tell them that this is all fake news, they will believe it. If, if you want to tell them conspiracy theories of any type, they will believe it because they're already trained to believe not on evidence, but on faith and based on who's telling them and whether it makes them feel good. These beliefs are dangerous. And that's why it's important for us to have discussions like these. They, are, they do cause people to be uncomfortable, but there's a thing called cognitive dissonance. It's when you feel a little bit uncomfortable and that's when you can have a breakthrough. It's up to us to try to shake people loose and to have a breakthrough. We might not make it all the time, but we at least need to speak the truth as we understand it and invite dialogue. Now, if anybody's listening to this uh, broadcast or this video who does not share my view, if you are getting incensed and outraged and really, really mad right now, I urge you, don't get mad. Get even. Even the score. Bring out the best and the brightest that you know of who can argue the Christian point of view or the Orthodox point of view or the position that Jesus is the Messiah. I welcome that debate and discussion. Contact me, call me, and at the drop of a yarmulke, I will accept the challenge, and I will be happy to engage in friendly dialogue. You can do that by going to the website of Congregation Lador Vador and contacting me, Barry Silver. I welcome 
such a discussion by any authorities or clergy that you know. Anybody else want to share some thoughts? I think Emily um, okay. wants to say something. Okay, first of all, the whole concept of virgin birth is just beyond anything that's reasonable. And that was taken over uh, by any group that wanted to prove a savior was going to help them from Shaka Zulu all the way up, you know, any group. They took over this false thing of virgin birth. That, that's a, a, a basic tenet, this ridiculousness. But that's not the big evil in believing in this whole Messiah is going to save us thing. The evil is that it takes away the responsibility from the person to be good, to make the world better, to be kind, because all you have to do is believe in the tenets of that religion and quote unquote, God or Jesus will take care of everything. And that's the real evil. It, it fosters complacency. Thank you very much, exactly. It, it lets us look to a supernatural source to solve our problems. It's kind of like a child who feels that my parents can help me, but I am powerless, and it makes us powerless. And we've seen throughout history that when people wait for the Messiah or, the, or a savior, even Jews during the Holocaust who were praying that God would save them were, were sadly disappointed. This whole concept of waiting for a savior doesn't work. That's why I say the word Messiah starts with me, M-E and Messiah. Each one of us can be a little Messiah. And if we all work together, then we can accomplish, uh, we can save this earth. And the last letters of Messiah, Yah, also is Hebrew for God. So each one of us has godliness in us, a savior in us, and can accomplish these things. By the way, there's something even more pernicious about this virgin birth concept. The virgin birth, Emily, as you say, was ubiquitous throughout all the mythologies of the ancient world. It was also something that fit in well with Greek mythology. The Greeks had this concept of a dualistic system. There was the physical and the spiritual. The physical had four elements to it. It had the, the wind and the land and the air and the water. And everything was comprised of these four elements in the physical world. And there was a fifth element or a quint essence is how you say fifth essence, and that was the spiritual. And so you had the spiritual, which was perfection in the abstract, and then you had the physical, which is imperfection. According to the Greeks, they had this concept that women were part of the physical world. The men, left to their own devices, were spiritual beings, and they just wanted to think about God. But women lured them with, with, with physical desires, and that's why Eve corrupted Adam, who left to his own devices would have been fine, but the women came in and corrupted them. Not only that, but if you're born of a woman, if you're born of a woman, the woman has had sexual intercourse as so she's tainted, and you're coming through a woman's body, which is soiled. And therefore, if you're born in the traditional fashion through a woman, you can't be pure, and Jesus had to be pure. Therefore, he couldn't have been born in a normal way. He had to be born in a miraculous way through a virgin birth. Now, by the way, this immaculate conception, most people think that applies to Mary, that Mary, he was immaculately conceived through Mary. That's not what it means. Immaculate conception is describing the birth of Mary. That Mary, when she was born, was immaculately born, so that when Jesus was born of Mary, he was pure. He wasn't tainted like most people are coming through a woman because Mary was not like other women. She was born immaculately. And, it, it, and the whole thing feeds on this prejudice and antipathy towards women as the source of evil and women in, in, the, in the Bible being created as an afterthought. Like Adam was where the action was and he had these animals and they didn't do it for him. So he needed to have someone who's a suitable helpmate. So Eve came along, not as an independent woman who was born of her own right, but merely to serve Adam's needs. This is a very pernicious aspect of believing in the whole Adam and Eve story. And it's why we need to, to be liberated 
of these myths. The myths teach us a lot, but they also teach us where we came from and where we need to be going. Anybody else? Well, I thank everyone for, for joining us. And I do want to let you know, we have a really interesting Shabbat celebration planned for this Friday night. I was working with, uh, with Arnie. I just want to tell you just a little bit about it. This Friday night, we are really going to share in words and in song the, the beauty of this concept of a rational interpretation of Judaism about creation as it really occurred. And uh, we're the whole, the whole Shabbat celebration is going to be focused around that in a very spiritually uplifting manner. I'm very excited to share it with you. And we'll be, um, I think it's going to be a very innovative type of uh, Shabbat celebration for you. And it will be, if nothing else, very interesting. So I, I welcome you to join us on uh, Friday night. And also, we're going to try to pull off something very interesting. Friday night will be a pre-recorded Shabbat celebration, but at nine o'clock, it will become interactive and we will share thoughts with each other. We'll say hello, we'll share good news, and we'll also share thoughts about people who maybe agree or disagree with what was expressed at the Shabbat celebration or other things that you'd like to share. It's gonna be a very interesting Shabbat celebration. It'll be innovative. I'm not sure if it's gonna be, if we'll pull it off without a hitch, but I'm looking forward to it and I hope to see you there. Rabbi? Yes. Yes. Uh, question. I'm trying yes. to put my arms around the whole rational Judaism concept. A lot of what you said was based on the Bible, the biblical Bible. But almost everything in the biblical Bible are myths, according to what we're saying. I mean, the whole Passover um, story, parting in the sea and everything like that, Noah and the ark. It's all a myth. So if the argument is it's all a myth, how could we use what's in the Bible as a defense for Jesus not being the Messiah? Uh, that, that's a very, very good question. In other words, if, if I'm making the claim that the Torah is not God's word, if he didn't fulfill God's word, how could I claim that? Because I don't think it is God's word. So if he didn't fulfill that requirement, that doesn't dispel anything. Here's the thing that I've learned as a lawyer, okay? I'm not just a rabbi, I'm a lawyer. So I, I appeal to the jury, J-U-R-Y, and also J-E-W-R-Y. So let me speak as a rabbi and as a lawyer. The Christians make an argument. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of Jewish scripture. I don't make that argument, they do. Therefore, their argument is logically inconsistent. If they're saying that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Jewish scripture, and I can show that he did not fulfill the prophecy of Jewish scripture, whether I believe in Jewish scripture or not, doesn't matter anymore because their argument doesn't hold water. They're making the claim, their whole claim that Jesus was the Messiah is based on another claim that Jewish scripture is the word of God. I don't have to prove that because I don't believe it. But for their argument to stand, it's built on a foundation of Jewish scripture being God's word. That's why it's very interesting. When I debated the Christian, the Jewish person who was born Jewish, and then he was saying that Jesus was a fulfillment of Jewish scripture, something very interesting happened. I said, Jewish scripture is not the word of God. And the Christian was saying, no, Jewish scripture is the word of God. So you have Jewish, you have Christian people saying to me, no, Rabbi, you're wrong. Your scripture is God's word. And I'm saying, thanks for the compliment. I don't think so. <laughs> so the Christians have to say that Jewish scripture is God's word. Now, by the way, here's something that's very interesting. If Jewish scripture is God's word, why don't they follow it? So for instance, in Jewish scripture, the Sabbath is on Saturday. Now, Christians will tell you, well, there's a lot of rules we don't pay attention to anymore. They're kind of like insignificant things like how to sacrifice an animal. We, we don't need to de deal with the details, but this is kind of a biggie, right? It's in the top 10. It's in the 10 commandments. Seventh day, you rest. That's Saturday. Now, there's something else in there. If you don't rest on the seventh day, if you rest on the wrong day, 
then something bad happens. You're executed. It's the death penalty if you don't accept the seventh day. So this, this, the Christians say it's God's word, but they don't follow it. They don't follow as far as the Sabbath. They just changed it. Where did the change come from? Well, some people just decided, let's do it on Sunday because we want to be different than the Jews. We don't want to follow their day. So let's make it on a Sunday. There's a lot of other things in Jewish scripture. Like all of Jewish law isn't followed. You might wonder, how can they rationalize that? If they say Jewish scripture is God's word, how can they rationalize following virtually none of it and turning it on its head? Well, of course, they got a, a rationale for that. You, you, they have a reason for everything. Ah, Jesus changed everything. He changed all of it. So when he came, all those rules were out the window. Now all you have to do is believe in Jesus. It sounds good, except, <laughs> except if somebody like me comes along, has actually read Christian scripture, they will tell you that Jesus said, I have not come to change a jot or a tittle of the old law. <laughs> so now that argument is out the window, but it's simple. Just don't mention that phrase and pretend he never said it. You're good to go. Good question. Very good question. Anybody else have any questions? Wait, Sydney, I can't hear Sydney. I think we're, I think we're. I think uh, Sydney had something else to say. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, the thing that in the Passover story that bothered me a lot was the, the worst plague was the killing of the Egyptian firstborn. And then Moses goes to Sinai and brings down the Ten Commandments, one of which says, don't murder anybody. <laughs> How do we explain that? That's a very, very good question. Now we're going off into different topics, which is great. We're going off the different, but I like this. This is a very, very good question. And there's a whole bunch of questions like that. Let me explain how that's done, okay? First of all, in Jewish scripture, God is the law unto himself. Anything God does by definition is kosher and okay. Now, if you're brainwashed, there's an easy answer for that. Very easy. To you and I, it sounds like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Thou shalt not murder, he's murdering. Ah, you have to understand the orthodox or the fundamentalist mind, okay? So who's smarter, us or God? Who knows more about justice, us or God? You start out with an assumption. God is all true, all just, all moral, all perfect. Whatever he does is perfect. Therefore, if it seems to us like there's something wrong, that's only because our limited intelligence can't understand it. It seems like a contradiction to us only because we're just too dumb to figure it out. Now that sounds somewhat plausible, but here's the problem. Once you accept that line of arguing, logic and reason just flies out the window. There's, and, and anything goes. There's no more morality, there's nothing. As Voltaire said, if you can convince someone to believe in absurdity, you can convince them to commit an atrocity. So now once I say, if God says it, it's gotta be just and gotta be true, and I can't question it. Now, if God tells me to murder someone because they believe a different way, I can't question it. Now I'm a lethal weapon. How do they, but how do the rabbis attempt to explain that? Well, it's payback, it's punishment. The Egyptians killed the Jewish children. Moses escaped in a basket and therefore it's payback, divine payback. It's like if a kid acts up in class and the teacher sentences all of them, or says all of you have to stay late. It doesn't seem fair, this collective punishment, but God was really, really big on collective punishment. To, to our modern sensibilities, that doesn't seem fair, especially in the flood. You mean all people are gonna die, even children? You mean all the animals? What did they do? They're all gonna die too? It doesn't seem fair, but collective punishment was pretty big back then. And the Egyptians, they, uh, they brought it on themselves, supposedly. The, the Torah also says, thou shalt not murder. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill in the Ten Commandments. Al tiltzach. Tiltzach means murder. For God to do something can't be murder because God can't murder. He's, all, he's the God of justice. But also, murder is the taking of life that's not justifiable. Collective punishment in those days was deemed justifiable. Therefore, it didn't constitute murder. 
So there you go. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. And I want to thank Sharon for uh, making all this possible. It's great being with you. And I look forward to seeing you at more discussions in the future. And also, read my articles in the Jewish Journal. And if you want, check out the article online right now in the Jewish Journal that I wrote about the Titanic. And you'll see a very interesting analogy between the Titanic and today. Thanks for watching.